Welcome to Legal Bites. If you're new here, my name is Alita. I'm a lawyer licensed in California and DC, and on this channel, we make sense of the law one bite at a time. Whether it's live trials or splashy legal headlines, we are here for the facts in the law and no nonsense. Well, unless it comes from our furry four-legged friends, of course. Here's where you bring your unique perspective to agree or disagree with other people, but please, always in a way that's civil and productive. After all, we're here to get to the bottom of the truth with a capital T, and the best way to do that, of course, is with healthy dialogue. So if that's what you're looking for, jump on in. We would love to have you. Let's get started. All right. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, happy Thursday. I had to double check. (laughs) Uh, It's one of those days. Um, But yes, happy Thursday. Hope you guys are having a great week so far. Hope things are going well. Um, Things are taking an interesting turn in some spaces of the world. Um, To just dive right into the Corey Richens uh, case topic. And also this cat over here, you are just getting in the middle of everything, aren't you? Um, okay. You want to go over there? Fine. Fine. Just stay off the laptop. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so we've got, we've got some, some stuff to talk about in the Corey Richens case. This is, as I've mentioned in my social media posts about this, this is my first, my first time covering this case. I know it's been going on for a while. Um, you know, and, and other folks have covered it pretty extensively. I know, I know Emily D. Baker's covered it. I'm pretty sure uh, like lawyer, you know, has probably covered it too. Um, you know, Ian Runkle and, and, uh, lawn lumber, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure they have. Um, but anyway, uh, this is my first time diving into it, but I figure with this one, uh, we're going to go over a search warrant from almost a year ago. And it's going to go over like the, some of the, the main details some of the main allegations in the case, generally speaking. So, you know, anyone who's not familiar with this case, if you haven't been following it from, you know, like l- tracking court TV or long crime or, you know, or any of the other, uh, people around law tube that have been covering this case. Um, you'll get, you'll get brought up to speed in this video as well. So, um, okay. Yeah, here we are. Um, good to see all of you guys here in the chat. Very happy to see folks that are here live here on replay. If you're watching on on replay, hello, hello. Thank you for, thank you in advance for liking the video, um, engaging in the chat, engaging in the comments, or if you're just lurking, that's wonderful too. Um, if you can like the video though, it does help. It really does help. Okay, folks. So let's get into it. Shall we? If you're not familiar with this case, Um, I figure a lot of people probably are, but just in case you're not, basic details here are, um, I put them in the description of the video as well, but basic details are Corey Richens is a mom of three, I think, um, who uh, lives in Utah and she was living with her husband who died suddenly. Um, She says that she had had. Uh, made him a Moscow mule to celebrate the closing of a sale because she has a a uh, she has a a real estate company where she would buy and flip and sell homes um, around the area, and so she I guess had had made some sort of a, a big closing on the sale of a house. I think that they had purchased one. She had purchased one instead of sold it, but anyway, um, a purchase and sale. Uh, there was, it closed and so they were celebrating. And so she prepped him a a Moscow mule, then went to, to take care of one of their kids because he's got night terrors. And so she laid down with him and then, um, came back several hours later at like 3 AM or something to join her husband, Eric in bed. And he was, uh, gone basically. So turns out there was, there was about five times the, the lethal amount of fentanyl in his system. And so now she's been charged with murder. So she's been charged with murder. The The allegation is that she was, had financial incentive mo- as her motive that um, they had been going through some problems. He had recently changed his, his um, will and trust documents to not have her be the uh, the executor, trustee, or beneficiary is my understand, understanding, I should say. 
Um, there was that. He also had had not had her on his um, his life insurance policy. She changed his life insurance policy to make her the prime beneficiary. And, um, and so, yeah, that, that's like what the, what the, what the main allegations are in this case is that she was financially motivated for all of this and that her business actually wasn't going all that well, that he was like trying to make moves on the side away from her to sort of like separate things out to like set things up for the kids and for him. And, you know, and he also like, there was another instance, um, in the past where, he had he had communicated with his family member saying, like, I think she just tried to poison me with some kind of a sandwich that she had given him. And he was like, if I ever die suddenly, she needs to be investigated. So there's a lot here. There's a lot here that, that's just very suspicious about her anyway. Um, but what she argues, what the defense is arguing, is that this was an overdose, that he was doing drugs on the side, that he had gone down to Mexico and gotten some some drugs or something like that. And basically that's that's what the allegation is there from from the defense. Oh, and also. Of course. Thank you for reminding me, Aussie J. Um, and wrote a book about children coping with grief. So after after he died, about I think it was about a year after he died, she came out with a children's book, basically, which she said was inspired to to help her sons cope with the grief of the loss of their father. And so this was like to help other kids as well. And so she was she was doing a book tour. She had gone on like local TV. Um and, you know, was was promoting this book. Two months later, she was arrested and charged. So it has since been taken off the market. You can't get it anywhere. You can you can you can you can search for it online. You can see that that it has been sold, but there's no way of actually getting a copy of it. I would know. <laughs> I tried. Um, and uh, so, yes. So that's 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 this case. That's this case is uh, the 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 grief children's book author. Uh, one that you may have heard about this one. Um, yeah, Christina Kirshner. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is how um, this is how all of this kind of ties back in. So now, now there are new allegations. Well, not exactly new allegations, but new allegations in the public sphere because there was a search warrant that was issued last May, May twenty six, twenty twenty three. That was, and I'll actually pull it up on the screen here. Um, that was issued for uh, Lisa Darden. Lisa Darden is Corey Richen's mother, whom she apparently was very, very close with and still is very, very close with. If you've also been following this case too, so like part of the lore here also is that there also was a whole hearing in this case on something called the, the walk the dog letter, which Corey Richens is, she's not out on bond. She's, she's in jail right now. And so she's in a prison cell waiting for trial. Uh, prison, um, prison officials found in her cell, a handwritten letter that was to her mother. And on at the top of it, it said like, walk the dog. And it sounds like that was like, it, it was some kind of, um, basically like code for something, but she was talking about uh, essentially there were, there were parts of it that the prosecution was saying that she was writing this letter to her mother to try to give instructions to give to her brother about testifying and to make things look in a certain way and, and all this kind of stuff. So, so there's also an, there's been an allegation of witness tampering in this case as well. So there's, there's that too. So if you've heard about like the walk the dog letter, that's this case as well. So they are very close and the, the mother and the daughter, Corey, Corey, the daughter, mother, the Le Lisa, the mother, mama, Lisa, <laughs> we can call her. Um, so, so they're, they're very, very close. Her mom has also gone on, on TV with interviews for, to basically defend her daughter. She's very vigorously. So, um, so, so she's been very active in, in trying to support her daughter, which a lot of parents I think would, I, I think, you know, going on TV and, and trying to, to defend your, your child's name. I think there are a lot of parents that would, that would at least feel the temptation to do so. However, however, the thing that distinguishes this case is that Mama Lisa seems to have, might have, appears to possibly have some skeletons in her own, uh, her own closet. So we're going to get into that. Okay. 
Is that enough background, enough intro <laughs> for this? <laughs> okay. So here's here's the search warrant here that I've pulled up. This is from, like I said, this is a, a May 26, 2023 search warrant. And it's interesting that it that it just became public this week. It was it was unsealed this week. So uh, you know, the prosecutors have had this, the court has had this, obviously, you know, um, I'm sure, I'm sure the 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 defendant has known about this for a while as well. Um, and of course, uh, Lisa Darden herself would have known about this because she is, um, you know, a, a subject of this search warrant. Um, and so basically what they, uh, what it says here is that, you know, that the, the affiant has reason to believe, uh, that on the items described as a blue Samsung stylus cell phone with serial number blank, it's been redacted belonging to Lisa Darden. Um, there is now certain property or evidence described as. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, and that said property or evidence was unlawfully acquired or is unlawfully possessed, has been used or is possessed for the purpose of being used to commit or conceal the commission of an offense, or is evidence of illegal conduct. So I think this is probably what they're getting at here is the evidence of illegal conduct. So basically, what the allegation here is right from the top is that Mama Lisa's blue Samsung phone might have some information on it that shows that there's some sort of illegal activity, whether that is illegal activity by Corey or whether that is illegal activity by Mama Lisa is unclear, but they think that there is something there and that's why they're requesting to, the, the ability to search the phone. Now, of course, what they're what they're looking for is is they, they want to get into electronic documents, email, instant messaging and text messages, personal communications, internet history, so any kind of browsing searches on the phone, personal and business schedules, photographs, images and video, contacts lists and phone numbers, call history, GPS location history, social media activity and messages, all other digital activities stored on the device. So basically everything. Basically everything. Everything that that this this phone can reveal they want to be able to get into it. And that's understandable. That's, you know, very, very common in these kinds of cases where they want to search a digital device such as a cell phone. Um, you know, I, I, and I'm really, really curious now to, 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 to hear what they may have found out if there was something that was, um, that was particularly, um, interesting to the prosecution in this case, or maybe, maybe another case. I don't know. Um, so let's get down to the facts here. So because in order to to you know have a proper search warrant, of course they've got to they've got to lay out all the facts to say why they think that this is proper to search the cell phone. Um, so I'm I'm going to skip this whole first paragraph because it's all about Jeff O'Driscoll his and his his background and experience as a police officer. Okay, sure, that's fine. Important stuff to have in a search warrant, of course, but. I think that um, we don't necessarily need to go through all of that here for our purposes. Um, so basically, suffice it to say, he's got a lot of experience here. Okay. Now is when we get into the meat and potatoes here. And some of this is going to be old stuff for, for those of you who have been following this for, uh, for a while. But then some of it's going to be new. Okay, on March 4th, 2022, at 322 hours, so 322 in the morning, Summit County Dispatch received a 911 call from a female party, later identified as Corey Richens, about an unresponsive male. The male was Eric Richens, Corey's husband. Deputies and EMS staff responded to the residents to attempt life-saving measures. Life-saving measures failed, and Eric Richens was declared deceased. Deputies held the scene and requested the medical examiner's office, as well as detectives from Summit County Sheriff's Office, respond to the scene. While waiting for detectives and the medical uh, examining investigator, Deputy New, sorry, Deputy Wynn uh, conducted an initial interview with Corey Richens. Corey stated she, Eric, and Corey's mother, Lisa Darden, had been celebrating Corey closing on a house for her business the night before, around 2,100 hours. So 24 minus... 3, 9 p.m. Yes, I can math, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 9 p.m. <laughs> um, Corey stated they had a drink to celebrate. Corey stated Eric then went to bed. Okay. And before we go any further in the facts here, this is very interesting. Coming from the perspective that we are we are looking at this particular search warrant right now, now with the um, with the awareness that there's something fishy going on with the mom. So the fact that Lisa Darden was also there. The night before, it wasn't just Corey and Eric that were celebrating the closing of this deal, you know, with with a cocktail. Lisa was there too. This is very interesting. 
and as we continue to read, if you don't, if you ha- if you haven't pieced that together just yet, why it is, you'll 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 piece it together in in a minute or two. Okay, Scor- uh, Corey stated Eric then went to bed. Corey stated she went to sleep with one of their children due to the fact that the child has night terrors. Corey stated she woke up around uh, three o'clock, three hundred hours, um, and came back to to I think it's supposed to be her in Eric's bedroom. Corey stated that at the time she felt Eric and he was cold to the touch. That is when she called 911. So of course, if you are, if you are, uh, you know, giving her all of the benefit of doubt, you know, maybe, maybe all of this is, is exactly correct. That, 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 that was the, the reason why that, that was the reason why she, she went over into their kid's bedroom initially, you know, when, when Eric went to bed was because truly the kid has night terrors. And that was one of those nights that he was having a hard time that that is possible. Or if you're looking at this from a bit of a more skeptical sort of perspective, um, you know, maybe she fixed him a cocktail and it was drugged and she was just waiting for it to do what it was going to do so that she had some plausible deniability of, of being there and not seeing it happen and, and kind of figured that after a certain amount of time that things would be done. Those are, those are two different ways of looking at it. Um, and, and both of both, both ways are, are, are reasonable. Um, Okay. Corey stated, okay. So, so, all right. I finished that paragraph after determining that Eric's death was not likely due to natural causes. His body was transported to the medical examiner's office to perform an autopsy. After approximately three weeks, toxicology findings from the autopsy were available. It was determined that Eric died from an overdose of fentanyl. When speaking to the medical examiner's office, the doctor indicated the level of fentanyl in Eric Richen's body was approximately five times the lethal dose. Five times. That's a lot. That is a lot. The medical examiner determined the fentanyl was illicit fentanyl and not pharmaceutical grade. It was also the opinion of the medical examiner doctor that fentanyl had been ingested orally due to the gastric fluid contents. So yeah, so he, he took something. It wasn't like it was, it was injected or anything like that. Uh, five times the usual. It wasn't, it wasn't anything that was, um, that was prescribed. It was illicit. It was made in somebody's somebody's lab somewhere, um, and so yeah, that's 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 a that's a pretty pretty bad look at that point. After receiving the information regarding the toxicology, a search warrant was obtained for Eric and Corey's residence. During the search the, during the service of that search warrant, Corey's phone as well as several computers were seized, seized as evidence. Warrants were obtained for all the electronic devices and the information from those devices was downloaded to be investigated. When investigators went through the information from Corey's phone, it appeared several text messages around the time frame from March 1st through March 15th had been deleted. That's the time surrounding Eric's death. Yeah, it was March 4th was his death. Several communications between Corey and blank were located. So this is, this is, uh, n- some names have been redacted here and we're going to get into a, a portion of the, um, of, of the search warrant that it's like heavily redacted because there are, there are, I think two people, maybe three, I think it's two people here that, um, that are being redacted for, for some reason. But you guys, if you, if you have been following this for a bit, you probably basically understand who, who one, one or, or all of these people are perhaps, Through the course of the investigation, detectives began to investigate individuals close to both Corey and Eric Richens. During that time, Blank was identified as being a housekeeper often used by Corey for her residential real estate business. A police records check of the housekeeper revealed multiple counts of possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute possession of a controlled substance and possession of drug paraphernalia. Um, Housekeeper also charges of theft, DUI, burglar, and aggravated assault. Due to the fact that fentanyl discovered in Eric Richens was illicit fentanyl, it was plausible that this person was the source of the fentanyl. So this is this is the 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 housekeeper of the Richens family, and um and this is this is someone who uh, has and and they they do mention this later on in the search warrant, but this person also admits to the police that she supplied Corey with with fentanyl. Um, so which 
the defense, you know, argues about this, this confession says that it's not a proper confession. There's like reasons why, why she would have, um, why she would have confessed wrongly. Um, and, 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 and more, I'm not certain if they have said that maybe Eric Richens got fentanyl from this person, um, or if they've, if they've gone that far, but for sure they have, they have like disputed this, this admission by the housekeeper, um, that, that she supplied Corey Richens with, with the drugs while conducting an investigation into this person. Blank was identified as an associate of housekeeper. Blank has a chemistry degree and had been previously charged in Heber County with clandestine clandestine lab charges for operating a methamphetamine lab. It was also learned that Blank has a boyfriend named Blank who is currently incarcerated at this place. So yeah, there's three people so far, <laughs> three redacted people that are so that are that are named here. And so it gets a little bit convoluted here since they haven't like They've just redacted these without like giving a new identifier, like person A, person B, person C, which would have been helpful, but that's okay. Um, yeah, uh, Jess Rubery, that's okay. So that is that is what I had initially thought was that they had they've tried to say he was a drug addict and got it in Mexico. There you go. Um, <clears throat> so okay. After learning this information, detectives spoke to staff at the facility and requested phone calls blank made from March 1st through March 15th. Because remember, there are uh, there are some there's some missing information from from Corey's from Corey's phone, some missing text messages between March 1st and March 15th. During one phone call between blank and blank on March 2nd, 2022, someone answers the phone and states he's on a break from drug court. It was verified through court records that this person and another person were in drug court together at that time. At 2.32 into the call, so 2 minutes and 32 seconds into the call, this person says, tell blank I say hello, I say hi. A female can then be heard in the background saying, hi, honey. This person then responds by saying hi in their name. On March 3rd, 2022, so that's the day after this phone call, uh, one of these people called phone number, this phone number, that is one of the phone numbers investigators identified as belonging to one of the three people. Grant starts the call, which I don't, I think that's supposed to be redacted, uh, starts the call by saying, good morning, blank. The remainder of the call is discussing a possible mutual acquaintance that knows that one of them knows in prison on March 4th, 2022. So the day after that phone call and the day of Eric Richens death, one of them makes a phone call to another one of them. <laughs> During that phone call, blank and blank are discussing purchasing an Xbox controller for the third person, I guess, while he is blank. Uh, one of them makes a comment that he would pay for the controller. Blank then responds by saying you or blank, one of the two. And then they respond by saying, I tried giving that B word, uh, $100 yesterday, uh, and say, Hey, let me pay you back. I'm paying you back. She's all what the F no, you keep it. I just made a thousand dollars selling effing fentanyl or some S like that. That call between blank and blank occurred the same day. Richens, Eric Richens died. So there's a, there's a $1,000 sale of fentanyl that's being referenced here between two other people. And so then, then we're going to get at, uh, what was, what, what did Corey Richens perhaps pay a thousand dollars for, or, or somewhere around there on March 27th, 2023, uh, one of them was arrested on misdemeanor traffic offenses and booked into this facility on April, oh, sorry, May 2nd, 2023, myself and other detectives interviewed one of them while she was in custody. Post Miranda warning, this person admitted to supplying Corey Richens with 15 to 30 fentanyl pills on two separate occasions, approximately one month before Eric's death. She stated Corey paid her approximately $900 each time she supplied the pills. She provided details of the solicitation of the drugs, the pickup and drop-off locations, and other pertinent details that has been corroborated with digital forensic evidence. So this is this is the thing that 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 the defense really has to contend with as to this particular confession by the housekeeper is that 
not only does the housekeeper confess to this, but it seems that digital forensics backs it up, which <clears throat> which is going to be very strong evidence. We saw that in the Caitlin Armstrong trial, the, the cyclist love triangle murder trial, um, digital forensics can do a hell of a lot to place a person in a, in a certain place in time that can, that can really, that can really, um, um, really sink the defense in some cases. And it, I mean, that's, that's basically what the whole case was in the, the Caitlin Armstrong trial. In investigating Corey Richens' associates, it was discovered that in 2006, Richens' mother, now this is where it gets really interesting about Mama Lisa. Richens' mother, Lisa Darden, was living with an adult female with whom she was having a romantic relationship. Um, in April of that year, her romantic partner died unexpectedly. This is going to sound kind of similar to some other fact pattern. An autopsy report of the female partner showed that her immediate cause of death was a drug poisoning from an overdose of oxycodone. Um, and so that is very, it's not fentanyl, but it's very similar. Um, oh, and also Scottish Jason, good point. A certain place or in a, or in a range of area though, it depends on how, how, how densely populated that area is. If it is Austin, Texas, where there are a lot of cell sites, it can, it can get pretty damn precise. If it's an area like, um, uh, like, you know, the, the Idaho state, um, murders case, um, uh, Coburg with that, that situation, it's a little bit more complicated because you have fewer and fewer cell towers. So things can, can, can bounce off of cell towers from further away, which, which, which decreases the precision that you can draw that information from. So very good point. I'm glad you pointed that out. Okay. So, uh, okay. Further investigation. Oh my God. This is where it just gets wild. You guys further investigation showed that Lisa Darden had been named as the beneficiary of her partner's estate a short time before her death. The female did have current prescriptions for oxycodone and reportedly struggled with abusing her meds. She, however, was not in a state of recovery from addiction at the time of her death. Based on my training and experience, this would likely rule out the possibility of an accidental overdose. There are, there are, I mean, this, this is definitely like, there's a little bit of, of, of argument here that the defense could definitely have on this. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of similarity here. Um, also Debbie Faison cook. Thank you so much for being a member for 16 months, helping to support the channel so we can, we can do the things that we, that we can do and, and, uh, focus, focus the time and energy into this channel. I love it. Um, love this chat makes modding easy. Wonderful, wonderful. Love it. And thank you for being one of our, one of our fantastic mods. Love the mods, love the work that they do. Um, okay. So so this is this is very very interesting. So Mama Mama Lisa had been investigated in 2006 for the death of her romantic partner who died unexpectedly. And shortly before that happened, shortly before the the romantic partner died, she had she had been named as the beneficiary of her partner's estate. I don't know if she like what I what I really this is this is my this is this is my, my, my trust in estates litigation side, like coming out, like I want to put, put that hat on as like, I want to know how soon before it was like, did she make herself into, into a trustee or just a beneficiary? Was she there? Like, what is the full analysis for, for like, did she unduly influence her, um, to make that decision? There's, there's a number of, there's a number of things that can happen that, that, immediately drive up the the suspicion level with somebody's testamentary documents being changed shortly before that person dies. Um I mean usually what we would be looking for in like when I was doing trust and estates litigation is like okay like the the time surrounding when this person changed their estate documents like did they like did they drive themselves to the to 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 the let's assume that it was, you know, a law firm that helps them with it. First off, did they go by themselves? If they, if they, 
didn't, were they driven by somebody else? If that person drove them, were they part of the meeting to talk about this, you know, with, with the attorney or did the attorney kind of pull this person aside and make sure that a, they were competent to be able to, to do this and B, this is what they actually wanted that they weren't being unduly influenced by somebody else. There's a whole analysis that you can go through. And it also, by the way, includes other contextual cues of like this person's whole life. Like were they were they particularly sick? Did, were they were they struggling? Were they relying on this other person for for a lot of um um for for like a lot of things for their for their everyday life? Um, you know, is this person who was a drug addict and this person and you know this the 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 beneficiary was somebody who was giving them help with all of this stuff? Like that can that can create a situation where someone may have been unduly influenced by this other person to basically give them everything over at the end of their life. Now, of course, things can change when, um, when, when the, 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 the person who, who is, is having this person change their estate documents, like the, the beneficiary, I'll say, if they, if they end up like marrying this person, it's a lot harder to, to, um, to argue that that was that that was undue influence because usually there's an expectation that like when you marry someone you're probably going to give all of your stuff to this other person that's usually the expectation but it's different when it's a friend or when people are dating or that kind of thing um here however it seems like there's nothing there's nothing in this that indicates what the result of the investigation from 2006 into Lisa Darden and her romantic partner was like wh what what resulted, right? Like, was there, I mean, it seems like there wasn't any sort of criminal, um, criminal, um, like charges that were filed or anything like that. So there's, there's that. I also am curious if, to hear if there was some sort of a, a fight over, over this romantic partner's estate. Was there someone else who was supposed to take from it? Um, another important analysis or, or another important piece in the analysis here would have been also, did Lisa Darden not just become a beneficiary of the estate documents, but did she also become a trustee? Meaning, did she, did Lisa Darden end up being the one who who was in charge of administering the estate afterwards? Did she get control over that whole process? That's also important. Or was was control still in the hands of somebody else, and she just got a minor minor piece of that estate? There's there's a there's there's there, there are some details here that can make this look worse or better for Lisa Darden. And so I wanted to point all these things out so that we are looking at this because it definitely at first blush looks really, really, I mean, even at second blush, this still looks really pretty shocking and pretty wild, right? Because there's, there's some odd similarities. So, um, it's very, very interesting here. Um, but you know, we still want to be making sure that we're pausing enough to ask the, how many questions, how many questions, you know, we can ask a, a, about this whole situation to see if, if there's another way of looking at it before we, we, we go down too far down that, down a particular path. Um, so, but I mean, I will say this does look, it looks, I mean, it looks really suspicious. It looks, it looks this suspicious. Don't tell me it's suspicious. Don't tell me it's suspicious. Don't be 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 suspicious. John Ralphio? Go on, to take his son as well. So yeah, we, <laughs> we've got some questions here. Um, okay, so let's, let's continue. Let's continue on because um, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's continue on in reviewing forensic downloads of Corey Richens phone. It is clear. She is very close to her mother and communicates with her almost daily, both for personal matters and in her business dealings. Uh, conversations have been found on Corey's phone showing disdain for Eric on Lisa's part, which it can happen. I mean, it's not great when, when in-laws are like, you know, not, you know, expressing, expressing negative things about their, their, their son-in-law or daughter-in-law. It's not great, but it happens, you know, sometimes when, when someone gripes to their parents about their spouse, you know, oftentimes spouses or the, the parents will, will, you know, say things to support their kid and it happens, but you know, I, it doesn't look good here. That's for sure. 
Based on Lisa Darden's proximity to her partner's suspicious overdose death and her relationship with Corey, it is possible she was involved in planning and orchestrating Eric's death. So what they are saying here is, I mean, it's not just like there's there's two ways of looking at this now, right? There are two ways of looking at this. Either one, Corey was watching what happened with 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 Mama Lisa and the um <clears throat> and uh, and and her romantic partner, and she saw okay, this happened. She was investigated, but nothing came of it because it just wasn't enough, right? It's just it's just an overdose, right? Like this this romantic partner had had a a uh, had had a, a struggle with, with abusing her, her medication before. This is something that was prescribed to her, but she, you know, had, had, had in, um, uh, a hard time with recovery from addiction. But, but I mean, as the state says at that point, she wasn't in a state of recovery from addiction at the time of her death. I will say it is always possible for somebody at a moment's no notice to, to relapse suddenly. Um, so there's a, there's a possibility either way, you know, looking at that, like I said, there's some room for argument by the defense. However, um, you know, like I said, there are two ways of looking at this. You can say that Corey just saw what happened and was like, Hmm, interesting. Maybe I can learn from this. Uh, maybe I can do something similar and you know, what have you, or you can also look at it and say, as the state here, or well, the, the police um, here say very, very clearly is it is possible she was involved in planning and orchestrating Eric's death. So meaning as, as of this search warrant, the state was definitely looking at Mama Lisa to see if there's anything that, um, that suggests that there was some sort of a conspiracy to, to help uh, kill Eric. If there are text messages, if there is GPS data that that corroborates certain things, um, there's a there's a lot of ways that the police can can look for can look for for you know little little um, little breadcrumbs if they can uh, you know if they if they happen to match up with with other pieces of information like with the housekeeper or with you know places that Corey was or you know, there's a lot of different ways that they can line this stuff up with digital forensics. On May 8th, 2023, detectives served a search warrant on Lisa Darden's house. A blue Samsung cell phone was recovered and identified as Lisa's current cell phone. I'm applying for a warrant to search the digital contents of that phone. So that is basically, basically it. I mean, it's, I'm, it's very, very interesting that this has been made public now. Um, the timing of it is very interesting. Um, it is, I'm wondering if we're going to see something in this case that either, either is suggestive within Corey's case that they are going to add another charge of, you know, some sort of conspiracy, um, or if we'll see perhaps charges against Mama Lisa. I don't know. This is very, very, very interesting for sure. Um, yeah. And also. I should point this out too. I, I forgot to mention this earlier that as, as to the, the investigation in 2006 into the mom, you can look at that in two ways. You can look at that and say, okay, she was investigated. They didn't find anything. It's because that's because there was no foul play. That's because this truly was an accident. That's because the woman that she loved, you know, overdosed because she, she, re she relapsed one last time. Um, and, you know, and that, that therefore, you know, there was, there was nothing, nothing wrong, no harm, no foul. Um, or you can look at that and say, she got away with something, you know, she intended to do something and she got away with it. Um, either way, either way, it's, it's very interesting in terms of the knowledge that that whole incident would have given to, to Corey and, and moving forward with this. Um, yeah, it's just, it's very, it's very interesting. So this is, this is, yeah, like I said, this is going to be a really interesting, um, case to keep watching and to see if there's going to be some more, some more, um, some more developments down this particular thread.
Uh, Matthew Newton, interesting comment. It's much likelier that the girlfriend's death from fentanyl was accidental and that it gave Corey the idea to do what she did rather than this being a second opioid murder in the same family. That Honestly, either either one of those is an option. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's very interesting to find out what the police did find from the search of Mama Lisa's phone. What were some of the communications between the two of them? Um, you know, did, did, you know, maybe that first one was in fact a tragedy and maybe, maybe it's also true that Lisa really didn't like Eric. And so she was willing to do whatever it took to, to set up her daughter in a way that was, you know, good for the rest of her life and helped her out and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. That's, that's, that's also possible. Um, so like I said, Digital forensics will will end up showing us a bit more on that one. All right, folks. I think that for me about does it. Um, let's see here. Indy's not in her usual chair. Um, but uh, okay. All right, folks. So yeah, that was it. This is kind of a, a bit of a sh shorter live stream as far as live streams go. Um, but uh, this has been uh, just, this was just such a, such a fascinating development that I really, really wanted to go over this with you guys and just to talk about it and for sure to start talking about this case a lot more as, as it develops um, in court in Utah and sort of progresses towards, uh, towards trial. Um. And this is interesting, Scottish Jason. Timing of this makes me think state is wanting to keep this in news and evidence is not as strong. So they're looking to influence court of public opinion. Possible. Possible. It's definitely possible. Um, that said, I mean, what is available to the public about a lot of the other in, the other evidence that has sort of helped to, to corroborate the state's case is um, – is, there's there there's a lot there is a lot so far at least that I'm aware of that is pretty helpful to to the state um for example like these these prior communications that he had made with others and th these these behind the scenes sort of fights that that Corey and Eric had had over money and over like seemingly it seemed like like he was he was trying to pull away maybe gearing up to divorce sometimes that can also trigger someone to do something as crazy as this so I don't know. I'm not sure, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, that's an interesting point though. All right, folks. Okay. Uh, let me know what you guys think in, in the chat or in the comments. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to head out of here for now, but thank you so much for joining me for this. Thank you so much for liking the video and for commenting in the chat or in the, in the comments. Um, and also just, just for watching. Thank you guys so much. And I will see you guys in the next video.